Michelle Chaburka, Cloud Security Advocate. That's all really you need to know about me. Go see me on LinkedIn, because <laughs> I want to get to the material. Dora, for those of you who aren't familiar, Mr. Dora is right over there in the house. Nathan Harvey, yay, we love him. I wanted to call him king of DevOps, but he, he said he didn't like that. Um, so we need to come up with a name for him. But Dora, DevOps Research and Assessment Project. Um, go see it online. What is it about? Well, it's about we want to know how to get better at getting better. That's what it's about. That's all you need to know. Um, so hello, Dora. <laughs> so these are some findings from the most recent uh, State of DevOps report. And uh, you'll see some standard kinds of things here, build with user, you know, build a user-centric kind of application, um, amplify technical capabilities with excellent superlative documentation, um, increase infrastructure flexibility with cloud. But the very first one up here, I want to point that out, establish a healthy culture. That's what we're going to talk about today. This is the DORA core model, and you'll see that capabilities predict performance, which predict outcomes. And in the very first section under climate for learning is generative culture. What? But what is a generative culture? We talk about it a lot, and the study talks about the effects, but does anybody here really know how to build a generative culture? It's kind of hand wavy a little bit, you know, because everybody goes, yeah, we want some of that. Well, I'm going to tell you about generative cultures. OK, first of all, we're going to break down the culture part. And this is from Westroom, because um, a lot of the material in the DORA report is based on Ron Westrom and his uh, organizational typologies. I've put a link um, and some information at the bottom. I would encourage you to go read this document if you haven't. But he talks about how culture is defined as the organization's pattern of response to the problems and the opportunities that it encounters. OK, that's a little like that. Um, I like to think, and he actually says this in the paper, that um, culture is the personality of an organization. Is it toxic? Is it super positive? That's what we're going to talk about. So this is from Westrom's organizational typologies. It's broken down very simply. We've got the pathological, the bureaucratic, and the generative. OK? I think you kind of know what the pathological is going to be like, right? <laughs> it's in the name. Um, but I'm guessing that probably all of us have worked at each of these organizations over our career. So pathological sounds like the name, uh, low cooperation, you shoot the messenger, responsibilities are shirked, you know, nobody wants to bridge, nobody wants to cooperate or collaborate, and failure is about scapegoating. Who did it? Who did it? <laughs> right? And novelty is crushed because you can't work in that kind of environment with any kind of level of trust or psychological safety. Then you have the bureaucratic, not as bad, but still, you know, not the best either, where you have some modest cooperation, the messengers are kind of neglected, they're not heard, um, bridging is tolerated, uh, failure leads to justice because you broke the rules, right? That's what it's about. So novelty is still problematic, um, but the leader's focus is on departmental turf or kingdom building, whereas in the pathological culture, the leader's focus is on the personal. Right? Um, and then you've got the great performance-oriented generative culture. And in the generative culture, it's high cooperation and collaboration. The messengers are trained. Um, risks are shared. You've got this great bridging and collaboration. And failure leads to inquiry and curiosity. Well, why did that happen? How can we not have it happen in the future? Um, novelty is embraced, right? Uh, the leader's focus is on the mission. And if you're familiar with Robert Greenleaf's um, servant leadership, it's very much like that, where a servant leader is there to serve the organization, the mission, and its constituents, which is an empl employees and customers, right? In fact, I just want to point out an interesting fact. Robert Greenleaf came from engineering originally. See? 
So what does this all mean? Well, culture drives performance. The Dora research has found that teams with generative cultures have a 30% higher organizational performance than teams without. It seems obvious, right? Who wants to work and do, do your best work in a, an organization that isn't collaborative and trusting and positive? But you know what? You don't have to believe Greenleaf because there's there are other researchers who have found this as well. Has anyone here heard of the creative economy? It's an idea from Richard Florida. Um, it's this idea that uh, creatives drive the economy in, in cities and developers and engineers are creatives. We build things, right? Well, this is the climate for creativity and innovation. It's like they're buddies, you know? It's like Westrom and Ekvall hung out, but they didn't. I don't think they knew each other. Ekvall's from the 60s, he's from Sweden or something. No offense. Um, I don't really know where, <laughs> I haven't looked lately where he's from. But you see the attributes here, right? Challenge, that you feel um, that you're excited about work and that you're interested. Uh, that you have autonomy, right? That there's support for ideas, that you feel a sense of trust in, in the organization, that it's lively and playful, um, that there's debate where lots of voices are heard, right? Nobody's left out, and that conflicts are not unresolved, they're managed. And then there's, that allows for risk taking because there's support and psychological safety, and there's support for novelty. So, now we know that the idea is to create a climate for creativity and a generative culture, right? I think that's what we're looking, that's what we, we all can maybe agree to, that that's what the goal is. So how do we get there? Well, there's a field of study called restorative justice. It's um, a field that comes from criminal justice, and it talks about creating these, uh, what we would call a generative culture, they call a pro-social or a positive culture that focuses on uh, social capital, right? Now, I'm gonna call it restorative justice and restorative practices because restorativism uh, has, is a collection of practices that includes restorative justice, but you'll hear me use the terms um, you know, alternatively. So what, is restore, what, are, what are restorative practices? Because it's a field, by the way, it's not because I speak bad grammar, but it, it's also like considered a domain of study. So what is restorative practices? Well, it's this field within social sciences that studies how to strengthen relationships between individuals as well as improve the social connections within communities. And you'll hear about it, you'll hear about it in uh, criminal justice, in the social sciences in schools, if you have kids in schools, they might, might have a, a restorative practices or restorative justice program. Um, and you'll also see it sometimes in prisons and also in, uh, <laughs> that's not a good me landing on saying, oh, they have it in prisons. That's not what the workplace is like, sorry. Um, so <laughs> what does restorative uh, practices help with? It can reduce crime, violence, and bullying. Um, it can improve civil human behavior and strengthen civil society. Uh, it provides effective leadership. It actually, uh, you can use it to learn, to improve your leadership skills. And it can restore relationships and repair harm. Those two bottom ones are probably some of the most important. Now, one of the things to know, there is a therapeutic side to restorative justice and restorative practices. And it is about improving, so you have the, intra-relationship and the inter-relationship. The intra with yourself is probably the most important relationship that you can have according to restorative justice. So is restorative practices and restorative justice effective? Well, the findings, uh, the meta-analyses that have recently come out over the last few years are very promising. It shows a reduction in recidivism in criminal justice in terms of juveniles. Um, it shows uh, reductions in misbehavior and suspensions uh, used proactively. It can influence um, happiness and engagement. They've shown that there's a higher satisfaction level at schools, for example. Um, there's Improve, there are improvements in shame management, self-esteem, uh, reduced rates of re-victimization, and uh, 
Its use in the, in the workplace, though, is still a bit novel, but it is out there. So um, why am I showing you this about emotional intelligence? Well, this is a core competency of restorative practices and restorative justice. And remember how I told you relationship with the self and with the other? That's exactly what emotional intelligence is, right? You've got, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over a sinus infection, so I'm a little phlegmy. Um, so you've got uh, this self-management and self-awareness, right? what's going on internally. Then you've got, that allows you then to manage the relationship with others in the community and with yourself. And it allows you to do something really important for all of us in this room, which we have to do a lot because creating software is complicated. Remember the olden days when it was like two people in a room and you got to build something and that was it and you dropped it and you're like, yeah, we made a thing. And now it's like 20 people. And you have to talk to all of them and they're messy. They're squishy and, and weird. I don't want to be around anybody, right? I just want to make my software. Well, it doesn't work that way anymore. So let's talk about the key concepts of restorative practices. OK, warning ahead, there is going to be some jargon. I apologize. There's very, I tried really hard to find a way to eliminate as much jargon as possible, but it's there. The nine affects. When we say affect in sociology and psychology, we're not talking about effect, we're talking about affect, which is the biological response to a stimulus, okay? Feeling is the awareness of that response. Emotion is the story that you weave over that, okay? We say, we have a saying in sociology, which is that affect is biology, and emotion is biography, okay? So you're gonna hear me talk about affect and affective things a lot. So according to Nathanson, which is based on Tompkins, you have nine. They go from negative to positive. There's the list. You folks can read, I'm guessing, so I'm not gonna like read them off to you, right? This smell, by the way, uh, is a made up thing from Tompkins. It's like a bad smell, that's all it is. Um, the thing that you need to know is the central br blueprint that drives everyone in affect script psychology, which is people want to maximize positive affect. Seems obvious, right? We want to minimize the negative affect. We want to minimize the inhibition of any affect. That means we need to feel what we feel. And then you want to maximize the other three. So how does this play out? Why do we need to know that? Why am I sharing this with you? Um, shame occurs when positive affect is interrupted. Okay, I'm just gonna let you like take that in. Not shame that we think of, we think of shame as this deep, really damaging thing, and it can be, but it's also an interruption, okay? So anytime you interrupt positive affect in somebody else or it's interrupted in yourself, and guess what? Any time shame occurs, that interruption occurs, it interferes with the ability to build and create and sustain relationship, professionally and personally. Here's an example. This is a mind, this is like a conceptual thought tool that allows you to see the, re the reactions, the shame reactions. It's called the compass of shame. It's a classic tool from Nathanson. <clears throat> Withdraw, go hide don't want to talk to anybody, avoid, that's a shame reaction, don't take somebody's email, don't take their calls, don't respond on chat, ignore the meeting request, attack self, oh, I'm terrible at my job, oh, I can't believe this happened, oh, I'm the worst, attack other, this happens in security a lot, no, it's not my fault, it's you stupid security people, why did you, like, your vulnerability tool is terrible. Takes too long in the pipeline, you're the worst. That's why the, uh, the vulnerable application got deployed. So that's the typical response. Now here's something, another thought tool that he has called the relationship window. Very simple, people are happy, are happier when you do things with them instead of to them. Don't, how many people would rather have you do things with them? Everybody, it's like, that's pretty much everybody, right? You don't want to be treated like an object, 
Who wants to be treated like some, like a resource? Do we all love that word, resource? I'm a resource. We're not a resource, we're a person, okay? We're professional. But this, the relationship window is just illustrating, and I love how um, these people know nothing about Gartner, but you notice how the optimal place of width in the top of the window, I'm sorry, that's a little hard to read, um, where people are treated as subjects, not objects, it's in the top right, just like the, the Gartner magic quadrant. <laughs> Isn't that great? They have no idea what the, mag the Gartner magic quadrant is, by the way. So that is preferable to the high control where people are treated as objects, you know, command and control. That's what they mean by a two environment or a four environment. Oh no, don't worry about it. We're gonna do everything for you. We've got this like, this portal and you don't have to think about anything. We've chosen, we've pre-chosen for you. Nobody wants that, right? Or the not where they don't tell you anything and you're just neglected. So treat people as subjects, not objects. That's a key concept in restorative practices. So fair process, you may have heard of this. There's a famous article uh, that was in the Harvard Business Review, um, but it's an idea from the 70s. It's based on a criminal justice philosophy of, of procedural justice, um, process fairness, and it represents the with box, remember, the with box in the relationship window. The idea is that you have, there are three E's, engagement, when you want to change something or you want to do something, you're going to engage, hey, how you doing? We need to talk about this change that's coming up. What do you think about that? Yeah, you got some time? Cool, let's talk about it. Now I'm going to explain it. Yeah, we want you to add this new security capability into your pipeline. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about why I need that. Let's talk about what you think about it. Let me get your feedback. Expectation clarity. Okay, I know this is inconvenient for you, but if we don't do it, we're gonna get fined. Sucks, I know. But I need it done by this date. Does that work for you? Okay, maybe another week out, yeah? Okay, you get the idea? Fair process, in fact, Here's an interesting finding from the change management literature, of which I have a whole bibliography if you want it. I'll, I'll send it to you, just reach out. Um, even if the outcome is fair, people will reject it without fair process. Yeah. <laughs> um, fair process, by the way, a lot of people will say, oh, we don't have time for consensus. Fair process is not consensus. Fair process doesn't even equal outcome fairness. The process can suck, <laughs> but you're using, a, there's a fairness in that you're, you're working with somebody instead of operating to, uh, you know, to them and treating them like an object. Okay, this is something called the restorative continuum. It goes from left to right. Um, the informal to the more formal practices, from the proactive to the reactive, okay? Formal conferencing is out of scope. Uh, family, it's a like family group conferencing. It's a thing that they do in the UK. Well, they do it sometimes in the US, but it was really uh, pioneered in Australia and the UK in juvenile justice. I would encourage you to read about it. It's, it's very cool. Terry O'Connell was one of the ones who uh, popularized it. Okay, first effective statements and questions. This is really important. Um, for those of you, uh, some of you may have heard of active listening, maybe? Yeah, okay. Carl Rogers' book, it's really good, it's very short, you should read it. Um, it's this idea of, of listening actively, confirming what you're hearing, mirroring. Um, it, it's about asking questions about feelings. I know, I know. <laughs> you're thinking, why are we talking about feelings? Well, humans are emotional be beings right? They're very visceral beings. You think that you can separate them out, you, you're not, okay? <laughs> the science has already come down on that. It's already said that's not happening. People make very emotional decisions. I would encourage you to read the field of bounded rationality, Gerd Gigerenzer, Kahneman, which you've probably heard of, um, but we make um, emotional decisions. In fact, that's how we decide on preference. So we're going to use I statements 
and ask questions about feelings. You don't have to say, how are you feeling about this? You can say, hey, how's this landing for you? What's going on for you? Doesn't, you don't have to use the word feeling, which can kind of make people uncomfortable sometimes. Um, avoid why questions. Why did you do that? You know why? Because it means you're criticizing them. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You, nobody wants to be criticized, right? Because remember, what did we say about shame? Right? That's an interruption that interferes with positive affect, and it interferes with relationship. So um, you want to use active listening and nonviolent communication. Um, nonviolent communication from Marshall Rosenberg. Uh, very simple. I would encourage you to, to go read it on the website. Uh, observation. When you interrupted me, <laughs> feelings. I felt angry. Need, I need to feel respected. Request, could you wait or raise your hand when you want to speak? I've used it in emails, you can use it in meetings. It's not like it's a great conflict resolution tool and it lets you immediately yourself process that negative affect right away. Um, you want to avoid giving advice. And this turns into the more formal impromptu group dialogue. By the way, a great technique from a guy named Ben Fong Torres. He was a writer for Rolling Stone. They called him the king of tell me more. And everybody, all the celebrities, wanted to be interviewed by Ben Fong Torres. You know why? Because he just asked questions. Tell me more. That's it. <laughs> um, here's some feelings examples. I pulled this from the Marshall Rosenberg, one, like one of them, the New York uh, NBC site. It's just a small example. You can download a feeling list, keep it at your desk, and you're on a phone call, you're in a chat or a meeting, just use them. <laughs> I encourage it. Adding, by the way, adding I feel to a statement does not make it a feeling. I, everybody does that. I do it too. Everybody's guilty. By the way, you want to avoid, in nonviolent communication, it's very important to avoid um, Stating a feeling like, I feel attacked, that just criticizes the other person. So you really don't want to um, use that kind of word, right? I would encourage you, go get the feelings list, start practicing it. It's really handy because it makes you, it builds your emotional literacy, which is super important. Finally, circles. The circle, you'll hear about this a lot. If your kid comes home from school and, said, and you ask them what they did and they said, Hey, we did this circle thing. This is where it comes from, OK? Um, it's also an indigenous practice as well. Uh, I want to respect that, and I want to call that out. But um, it's a structured use of effective statements and questions. But what's magical about the circle is that it's about equality and participation. You know those people who never speak up in a meeting? They never get the chance. It's more likely to happen in a circle because they're sitting in the circle, right? They could pass, but now they're members of the circle, right? And if you're starting to think that this sounds a little woo-woo and fuzzy <laughs> and like, you know, squishy and kumbaya, I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be that way. I use them all the time. I don't call them circles, though especially with security folks. You don't want to do that, right? <laughs> um, what I do is I, I kind of, it's a, don't tell anybody, okay? Is this just between us? Shh. <laughs> um, I just call it a brainstorming session or, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to um, maybe provide feedback to each other. You know, I'll, I'll try to say something else, but it, if you can do a circle live, you don't want a table in the middle. That's important. That's one of the guidelines. Um, you want to choose your, your, um, the method of speaking, right? You can go around the circle. People can pass. You can use the popcorn method. And people have a talking piece or they raise their hand. You can do this virtually. They're very effective. Do it all the time. Hey, you have the check-in. Hey, um, I'm going to speak first as facilitator. And then I'm going to hand off to Nathan. Nathan, who are you going to hand off to? OK, great. So then he shares or he talks about you know, what the pro he responds to the prompt, and then you go to the next person. You know where this works really well? And I used this in grad school, by the way. There was a, a cop. She was a sergeant. And every morning, they would have a check-in. And she said, 
Michelle, I, like, and she said in the class, I don't know how I'm gonna do a circle. I only have like 20 minutes and all my cops have to talk. How are we gonna do that? I went, I got something for you. The scrum check-in, the daily stand-up. Let me tell you how it works. Here's the Agile timer. You're gonna let each people have two minutes. They're gonna use the Agile questions. I gave this to a cop and she used it. So in my mind, this is pretty, relatable and it's aligned with DevOps and Agile practices already, which I think are very restorative, which you read the Agile Manifesto, I read it the other night again, and it's about like collaboration and inclusion, about you know working together and teamwork. It's not about like somebody being in charge, right? That's the whole point. That's why restorativism works so well with that. And, uh, that's it for me. I've left four minutes and 25 seconds for questions. Um, there's the Dora report. Please download it and read it. The new one's coming out soon. There's me on uh, Linkertree, and there's the IARP, the school that I attend, the International Institute of Restorative Practices. Questions? <laughs> Wait, no questions? Come on. Criticisms, questions, nothing? OK. You, if you feel weird, oh, okay, great, a question. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, if you want to talk about this more, if you feel uncomfortable in this venue, I am throwing it out there. You can uh, email me. You can, um, you can certainly reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk to you, talk to a group, uh, you know, clarify, argue with you, resolve conflict. Any way you want. Please, yes. Sure. Generative culture, yeah, yeah. Generative culture. So in that, my question is, that is what you want to achieve. Yeah. I did, and that's the ideal. Yeah. Yeah, here's. Here, here, yeah. So I actually am building a restorative. Uh, restorative risk management framework based on these concepts. Um, it's my final grad school project, um, and I've been talking at security conferences about this, which is really hard. And I get very discouraged. They put me in the inclusion track at RSA. I get it, okay, but <laughs> it's not a DEI talk. It's about this is how we become more effective, right? Um, it's not easy. And it's going to take work. It's, it's called, there's something in restorative justice called institutionalization. When you bring the practices into an existing institution that has standard processes, be, be prepared to be discouraged. That's just, I, and every time I get discouraged and I throw things in, I think, what am, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do conflict resolution or peace building. Because you know why I do it? Because I stunk. I was terrible. I was the worst at this. So I had to have that moment where I realized that I was the problem. And nobody gets there overnight. So you're gonna have to be patient. You're gonna have to be the change that you wanna see. I mean, I, sorry, I, I hate that expression. It's so, ugh. but um, yeah, that's what it's about. And we have to support each other in the community. So join an NBC practice group. Join um, a restorative justice group locally. Go join as a volunteer a community mediation group. You can do that. You all can be the bringers of you know, collaboration and cooperation in your organizations by practicing. That's why it's called restorative practices, because you're not going to be perfect the first time you do it. Cool? Are we good? <laughs> Come get me if you want to talk more. Okay. <laughs>